Hi, my name is Josh Cooper and I'm going to be giving a presentation on the survey research design so that you uh, may learn more about it and understand it if it's something that you've never heard of before. So what is survey research? It's quantitative research um, using statistics to analyze the data. Uh, you're administering a survey uh, to a, a certain population and that survey is aimed at describing trends in the data. Uh, but the whole goal of it is to learn about a, a population's attitudes, opinions, behaviors, or characteristics, or looking at evaluating uh, systems and processes, specifically within the education uh, section or area. Um, in my school right now, uh, one area that we could definitely be doing some uh, survey research on is uh, we're starting to implement uh, school climate surveys. And so this is one area uh, that we could learn about populations, attitudes, opinions, behaviors, and processes, and um, systems at our school from a variety of different um, samples of populations. So when do you use survey research? Um, again, you use it to describe a trend as it relates to problems or issues. Um, that could be within education. Um, you're determining individual or population opinions or attitudes, uh, which then can help identify beliefs or attitudes towards a certain situation. And again, evaluating systems, processes, and programs within schools. And our school climate survey research that we are uh, about to uh, use this, uh, this spring is going to do a number of these things. While we might not be going through the whole research process, um, we'll be using a lot of these methods that I'll be talking about throughout this presentation. So how did this uh, research design uh, develop? Well, um, I think we've been using surveys for a long time, um, and we've been using it in education dating back to 1870, 1817, excuse me. And uh, throughout those years, uh, we've, we've started to improve it and make it more modern. And uh, in the 1950s, uh, through from World War I to World War II, um, a lot of modern surveys began to emerge. We had an invention of the Likert scale, which is a huge innovation uh, with the scale strongly agree to strongly disagree that we still use today in a lot of our survey uh, research designs. And then we had the, um, the uh, social research organizations start to come up, and our, those are kind of uh, positioned all over the world right now. And obviously uh, today and over the last uh, several decades, we had the age of information technology, which has been able to uh, provide us with a lot of innovations to help us um, continue to better our software and data collection and analytics. And right now, we, it's, it's really, it's, we're capable of, of really getting real-time data and collection and analytics. I just talked with a company um, that's doing this right now with uh, school climate surveys, and it's awesome to see that we can get our data in real time, and you can start to see uh, our data being analyzed as well. So what are the key characteristics of survey research? Well, the first one is to... Um, up with a sampling from a population um, and you have three different kind of areas a population a target population and a sample and so what are the difference between the three a population is a general group of individuals that you're trying to um, uh, send out a, a survey to or interview uh, and that could be for example uh, like the parents at my school so the parents at George Washington Academy um, the target population um, is actually minimizing uh, that sample population and understanding that uh, you might not actually be able to reach that whole list. So maybe we can target that populate uh, a specific group in that population and get specific uh, list of names. And then the smallest uh, would be the sample, um, and this would be if you know again if you cannot get the uh, whole population, you want to make the sample as large as you can, can as it can get. Uh, but the sample is going to be um, you know, chosen from either the population or the target population so that you have a broad representation. Uh, the best way of getting the sample is by uh, doing random sampling, but uh, there are other methods, methods as well. Second are just questionnaires and interviews. 
um, you know, you need to either create a questionnaire that's mailed to participants or electronic questionnaire. It's actually given to them for them to com uh, complete. Or you can have the researcher being more involved in a one-on-one -on -one interview uh, or to a group or over a telephone where they're actually administering the questions um, and recording their answers. Uh, so those are the two differences. It's who completes, basically, completes or records the data is the difference. So then we have instrument design. This is an instrument, uh, first of all, you have to look and see if there's an instrument available. Uh, usually it's better to choose an instrument that's available so you do not have to create one. There are lots of different companies out there that can partner with you, um, or there are lots of different free, there's lots of different free software out there that you can utilize, um, and uh, um, yeah, just uh, free programs that you can use to, to help make your uh, instrument design better. If not, though, you do have to design your own. You can uh, start by writing questions, but again, uh, they have to be uh, constructed wisely. Um, and here's an example over here, a couple of examples of where we have a poor question, talk about the problem with the question, and how to improve that question. Um, one example could be right here, do you support gun control? Well, the problem with that question is it's, un it's an unclear question um, because it's vague. Uh, and doesn't really provide any sort of specificity. So to make this question better, you would talk about, uh, you would ask, do you believe that guns do not belong in schools? So this is very broad. This is more specific that actually gets to your uh, question or problem or what you're actually trying to identify uh, in your actual research. So um, in writing your own questions, you have to just be careful. You have to know what you're doing and you, you, um, yeah, you have to be a professional and be able to, to can, uh, construct uh, quality questions. But then it just, uh, it's pilot testing, it's uh, sending out your instrument to make sure that it works uh, to a sample, small sample of people uh, so that you know that your instrument is working, whether you're using your own or using one that's already created. And the fourth one is response rates. This is the amount of responses that you get back. I think obviously you can realize that through the interview process, the response rate is going to be high because you're actually interviewing those people. And so you are determining who and who is not completing uh, the survey. With questionnaires, though, it can vary because, um, you know, when you're depending on how you're sending it out and how you're encouraging participants to participate, um, you can have a very high response rate or a very low response rate or somewhere in between. And I found this little uh, cool uh, illustration or comic and the guy's saying, just had a great idea. I'll fill out those surveys myself. Saves me tr some trouble. <laughs> the lady says, obviously, she knows best. She says, not a good idea. If you do this, she'll struggle to write a good method. So you might improve your response rate by being unethical, but uh, not a good decision when talking about your methods and will not create good research. But the largest concern really here is not really response rate. You can still create a good solid uh, survey research, um, but if you have a bias, um, then that's going to be a major concern, meaning um, you have surveys that are coming back and are not reflecting the population, um, et cetera. So what are the two types of survey designs? Well, there's two, one that's longitudinal and one that's called cross-sectional. Um, by words uh, and, and by the English language, I think you can see the difference, but I will get into those. So longitudinal study is basically talking about how it's done over time. Um, and this can be done to, oops, sorry, let me go back. This can be done um, to the same population, meaning you're given this survey to the same population, you know, this year and the next year and the next year. Or it can be done to a, um, you can also think about doing that to a specific group identified in your original population um, called the cohort. Or you can also give a longitudinal study to uh, the same people, um, meaning that you have the exact same people that are taking the survey time in and time out. Going back to the trend uh, given to the same population, this could be the same people. Um, it may not be. Um, there could be added people to the population, but in general, it's the same population, like parents uh, of, um, of GWA, uh, George Washington Academy, which is a school I'm working at, uh, GWA parents. But the parents may change, whereas over here, it has to be something specific, uh, a specific same population, same people. 
Cross-sectional, on the other hand, is a study at one point in time. So it's basically getting data at a specific point. It's saying this is a cross-section of, of our attitudes, of our, our community needs, of our evaluation at this specific time. Um, you can do this uh, with group comparisons, specifically like with my uh, school climate survey. We're going to be taking a look at parents, staff, and students' uh, responses to many of the same types of questions. So what are the steps in conducting survey research? Step one is decide if the survey, is, uh, survey design is the best design to use. Uh, obviously, you have to take a look at what does, uh, survey design is used for and determine if this is the best design to use um, in a, in, you know, rather than other de research designs. Uh, step two is to identify the research questions or hypotheses. You need to come up with specific questions and hypotheses that you think you want to direct your survey towards. However, this doesn't always have to be um, clear. Uh, you can also, you don't have to necessarily identify these questions, but you can more so identify that you want to get uh, just a broad range uh, of op uh, opinions and attitudes from a sample. And the third thing is to identify that population, um, the sampling frame of the sample, like I talked about earlier. You have to identify the group of people that you actually want to uh, give the research um, instrument to. And number four, you have to determine this survey design, whether it's going to be longitudinal or cross-sectional, uh, and the data collection procedures and how you're going to collect it, whether that's through an interview or a questionnaire. Step five, uh, you have to develop or locate an instrument, uh, which again, like I talked about earlier, means that you need to create your own instrument or use an instrument that's already built uh, for you to use. Then you have to administer the instrument, which is probably the most time-consuming, is where you're actually sending out that questionnaire or conducting interviews, um, and that takes quite a bit of time. Getting towards the end, you have to analyze the data and address the research questions uh, or hypotheses and come up with trends and come up with um, different areas that are being addressed using statistical analyses. Um, and then finally, you have to write the reports uh, using standard procedures um, within the research um, world. So what are potential ethical issues in survey research? Um, well, there's lots of ethical is issues in research in general, but um, specifically with survey research, you're looking at uh, the main areas of concern are data collection, analytics, and through the process of writing the reports. First and foremost, you know, you just have to understand if your topic is sensitive or not um, so that you know how to go about giving it and you actually have to um, submit uh, sensitive topics to a specific social organization before you would do it. You also have to make sure that your participants have consent here like this picture shows. Um, and when get, you are allowed to give incentives, but you have to just be careful about how you're going about giving incentives and being responsible with those and um, following up on promises and making sure that if you are saying you're going to give an incentive that you're actually going to. Um, and then through the interview and the questionnaire process, you just have to keep the um, participants' safety in mind and be responsible, especially with P, uh, personally identifiable information. You don't want to um, provide any sort of track back to making uh, someone's information tracking back to their actual identity. And then at the end, you need to destruct um, uh, the instruments that were used um, in the process after you conclude your research. And so how do you evaluate the survey research? Uh, well, there's a quality checklist that I found here in the text, and uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but it basically takes through, you know, did you follow uh, the survey research design process? Um, did you go uh, about uh, describing a specific target population, identifying how you got the sample, whether it was random sampling, discussing the size, um, uses the specific one uh, of the two kinds of survey research, whether it's longitudinal or cross-sectional, um, making sure you have clear instruments and um, instructing questions, uh, valid questions and quality questions. Um, and then reporting that information reliably, uh, discussing the procedures,